Welcome to the Weekly Poker Showdown brought to you by Party Poker. I am your host, Jamie Staples, and this week we have a very special episode. John Duthie joins me on the podcast. He's coming off a fifth place finish in the Millions Online event for, I think, around 890000 uh, And at the time of recording this, this was just like yesterday that this happened. So I get a conversation with him literally 24 hours after it went down. Talk all things about his poker career, how he started in poker, uh, you know, winning a million dollars at the Isle of Man back before I even knew poker was a thing. Uh, you know, starting the EPT, president of Party Poker Live now, and of course the crazy run yesterday and the things that he's learned throughout. So uh, I personally learned so much through through this conversation and some of the things he said I'm really going to be thinking about in a bunch of ways going forward in my career. So great conversation. I really hope you check that out. But before we do, we're going to touch on two things, the live and online results. Let's start off with online results, getting into that now. Kicking off with the online results, we obviously need to talk about Millions Online, the $10,300 buy-in event that beat the $20 million guarantee, uh, massive $2.6 million up for grabs for first place, uh, and we saw it come down to the final 27 players going into the day. $63,270 is what all of them were guaranteed going into it. And we saw Jungle Man Dan, no word on if that's the official Jungle Man, I don't think it is, uh, but they were the first casualty of the night. Team Party Poker Pro Isaac Haxton was the other Party Poker Pro to make the final and third day, but they busted as the short stack in 25th place for 63270 Uh Bapa burst the final table bubble when they cashed out in 9th place, uh, worth a cool $184,537, so GG to Bapa, uh, and then on to the final table. Uh, so we stream this final table, actually the whole final 27 on Twitch. That is on the Party Poker TV channel, so if you want to rewatch, you can go there, check it out, see some of our analysis. Uh, really interesting tournament, and actually not that long uh, to go from 27 to a winner. I think it's 5 hours and 15 minutes. So uh, sort of condensed and, and very manageable. In the end, uh, Bill Klucka was 8th place finisher for 316000 We had Pal Pal 012, 015 for 474. Cloud King out in sixth place. John Duthie with the 869,000. There it is. Rank One Global was the first millionaire at the final table, one of four. No means yes with 1.3 million. And the two made a deal heads up Lucio taking down 2.2 million. And French Sniper 2.25 million, which is a little bit more than the 2.22 million. So French Sniper is the champion of the Millions Online event for 2019. A huge congratulations. I can't imagine what it'd be like to win $2.2 million uh, in a three-day online tournament. Absolutely crazy. So huge congrats to them. Um, let's talk about some of the other online poker tournaments, which get dwarfed by this event, but you would expect that, of course. There's actually a $25,000 buy-in going on during the Millions Online series. Uh, this was added by the request of some players, and it reached 62 players. It was guaranteed a million, but it crushed that guarantee uh, by over half of a million dollars, so pretty incredible. Down to the final eight, uh, we saw Jason Kuhn bust out in fifth place, Party Poker Pro, for 108000 uh, triple sexy with the runner up 341k, but the eventual winner was R Moral 11 or Ryan Moral for 503,000. So, congrats to Ryan on that half a million dollar score in the 25k. Last tournament we're going to cover here on Party Poker was the big game on Sunday 5,200 buy in, uh, 500k guarantee. The prize pool ended up hitting 720,000. Uh, 144 players bought in and no limit hold'em. In all caps, that's the name. Ended up winning the tournament for 165k. Uh, runner up was player underscore nine nine eight eight seven seven six six. Anatoly Filatov, a guest that we've had on the podcast. If you missed that, definitely check out that uh, episode. Really great to talk with him. Uh, NL Profit as he goes online. Another Party Poker Pro. Eighty six thousand four hundred dollars for a third place finish in that one. So huge congrats to Anatoly. Uh, heading over to Poker Stars, let's talk about the $2,100 8 max progressive knockout. We saw Mike Sir Watts Watson, definitely a name that most people will be familiar with if you follow poker at all, ended up winning the event for 117 k this past Sunday. Stacked final table, uh, we have Simon Higgins, we have Renz Feenstra, we have Bill Lewinsky, definitely someone I used to battle with quite a bit. Uh, sick one, Klaus Sebrecht, sorry if I, I screwed up your name there, my friend. Uh, so absolutely packed final table with a lot of great players. 
But uh, as I said, Mike Watson, Sir Watts, was the champion for 117000 and uh, PokerStars also had a 10K PLO 6 max going on, uh, 500,000 guarantee, and the prize pool made it up to 690K. Pascal LaFrancois from Canada, my home country, ended up winning the event for 186,000. So that's all the online events this week, but now let's go check out some of the live poker action. On the live poker side of things, we have EPT Prague going on. The EPT Prague National is actually happening right now, which is 1,100 euro buy-in. The former main event champ, Maher Van Putin, making a deep run. Uh, 32 players left out of the field of 2,452 at the time of this recording. Um, they remain at 10 full levels of 60 minutes on day two. All remaining players are aiming for a slice of the 2.3 million euro prize pool have 7,390 euros guaranteed so far. The second thing you might want to know on the live poker front, if you are a Poker Go subscriber, uh, Rob's Rob's game going on in Vegas, huge cash game. I didn't get a chance to watch it myself last night for day one, but I saw a screenshot and there was a bunch of people with million dollar stacks. So incredible cash game poker happening. I'm sure there'll be some clips on social media uh, and consider getting, getting Poker Go as well and watching that because, I mean, it's not often you could see one million stacks battling it out. Uh, some of the highest stakes players in the game. So pretty incredible. Best of luck to Rob. Hopefully we have some good results to report next week. Let's get into the interview now with John Duthie, just to give you a little bit of background as to how influential this guy has been in the poker world. Uh, he founded the European Poker Tour back in, I think, 2003, 2004. Um, this is a show that's been on TV for 11 years now. Um, he is now the president of Party Poker Live. Um, so that's obviously a big thing. He took down a tournament back before I even knew what poker was for a million pounds on the Isle of Man. Uh, he's got second place at World Series of Poker Heads Up. He finished runner-up to Mike Sexton in the 2003 Heads Up uh, Championship in Paris, France. He uh, got second in a 25K Heads Up uh, scoop event. He played the first ever, ever World Championship of online poker on Poker Stars, uh, coming second place. So, I mean an amazing poker ped pedigree, you know, like he's done so much in the game. And of course, he just came fifth place, you know, 10 years later after some of these events in the 10K Millions Online that just happened for 860,000. But in the interview, we talk about so much more too, like what he's learned from starting back in the beginning to where he's at now and the difference in the game and the characters and, and what's good about that and maybe what's not so good and, and where we need to go forward from here. So... Um, really an incredible guy. I love this conversation. I think you're going to love him as well. So without further ado, John Duthie. Joining me today on the podcast, I have Mr. John Duthie. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time today. No, my pleasure. So there's so many things that uh, we can talk about. Your history in poker is long, as I was sort of doing a bit of research going into today, uh, learning about you know you starting the European Poker Tour. Uh, back in 2004, uh, you know, a lot of huge uh, live poker results back in that time as well. Um, currently, the president of Party Poker Live. But I think we need to start with the, the recent news coming off a massive score yesterday in the Millions Online event, the $10,000 buy-in, a fifth place finish for right around 900000 right? Uh, yeah. Right, right around seven, there. 870, wasn't it? Right, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is great. Yeah, so so I wanted to ask you, uh, day one and day two, sort of leading up to the final, because we watched the final on Twitch, but what were the first two days of the tournament like to get in that position? They were, um, well, the, 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 firstly, I mean, I qualified in the last minute, like you, actually, you did too, actually. I remember seeing you, and I was watching you Twitch at the same time as playing um, my uh, day two, yeah, my, my day two. Uh, I was watching you. Or was it no day 1B or... Did you play 1B? I played 1A and 1B, both. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was 1B mm -hmm. then. Because yeah. I qualified through a 1K satellite, the same as you did. Um, and uh, I'm tr if I, we're trying to remember going through, going through the day. I mean, day 1B, it was just... I, that just felt like a standard day of, you know, day of poker and just survival and trying to get, you know, chip up really right uh and pretty much the same for day two there was no 
I don't think, I, I mean, obviously I made a few sort of moves here and there. Um, I had hands too. I can't, I'm not, I'm really not, uh, it's, it's awful because I think a lot of people, a lot of people you speak to would go, oh yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, half, halfway through day two, I, I had this particular situation where, and I'm damned if I can remember any of the hands in day, you know, one B and day two. I mean, even even yesterday, you know, there's there's only one or two hands, that, key hands that I remember yesterday, which you 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 and Mona um, no, were watching, you know, and so the mm -hmm. king the king queen twice were obviously the the, the crucial the crucial money making hands yesterday. Yes, all in about um, like ten ten nine eight yeah. big ones. One of these even five. One hit the king in the river. One hit the queen on the river to uh, to double up and stay alive. So those were exactly yeah. those were intense. I mean, those were the those were the key those were the key moments. I think because I'd been nursing a, I misplayed a hand early on, um, and and actually got quite annoyed with myself because we started uh, we started the day. I think I was thirteenth in chips, but I only had like twenty six bigs or something, or twenty five maybe. I can't remember. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't a lot. And then I, I I made the mistake of I think after after about sort of twenty minutes or so I, was, I think I must have got a bit bored and I sort of opened under the gum plus two or in with king ten off suit I think it was right. and then continued on a queen high board and then did it, continued again when it came when I picked up a gut shot on a nine turn and. Uh, then an ace came on the river and I was contemplating moving all in. And then I thought, I just don't feel good about it. Right. <laughs> I don't feel good about this. I think I'm going to get called. And anyway, I, because I checked, I checked, uh, I checked behind and he showed, I think he had Queens and nines. So he turned, he turned two pairs. He had a big hand and he was just trapping me all the way. So that was, that was, uh, that took me way down in chips right early on, uh, and yeah. then I was hovering. I don't know if you remember it, but I was hovering around there for ages. You, you were short stack pretty much the whole way through after that hand. You know, yeah, like yeah. at one point down to four big blinds. Just, I mean, clearly just yeah, waiting yeah. for, for anything to happen. Um, but you you ended we're up riding that all the way to, to fifth place, of course. So like you know, yeah, maneuver well, through. Just classic, literally, uh, push fold uh, strategy. You know that that was it. I was just literally ba playing. But proper poker, right. <laughs> really, and because I did, I, but I knew. I also knew that it, I also felt really quite comfortable. I felt really quite positive. Um, mm. You know how some. I don't know if you get this, but sometimes when you're playing tournaments, you feel really zoned in. You feel in the zone. You feel very, you know, you just feel like you actually could win this. Right. Um, yes. And I felt. I really felt like that yesterday. I felt I could really win it. I felt very comfortable. I didn't feel under pressure at all. Um, I felt I was, you know, I felt I was playing well. And then when I got, um, when, when I, when we literally got to, when, when I got the ace king, really, I thought, right, if this, if this holds, you know, what I mean, well, holds, if this, if this, if I win this hand, I could really, you know, go on to win it. But oddly enough, when, when he hit the 10, uh, I, or the jack, I can't remember which one he hit, but I kind of went, I kind of was all right about it. I didn't. I wasn't really that bothered because I just, I just felt that I'd, I'd won so much money with such a short stack, right? Uh, that I felt that I'd already won. I felt like I'd already won the tournament. You know, anything after that was anything after, really anything after two hundred and twenty k was just a, a bonus to me, really. Right. Yes. And um, so fifth place was eight hundred eighty thousand approximately. First place right. was two point six million. So I mean. Crazy swings there, but I I empathize yeah. with that that position though I get it. It's like um, when I busted way earlier in the tournament, one B, you know I mm. lost Ace King to Aces, yeah, and no, I kind of had the same feeling where I was just like I I was totally at peace with with the idea of losing in that spot. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's because it's a big event and you recognize you're against good opponents, and it's just one of those things where well you did what you did and and life moves on. I'm not sure, mm. but but I I understand that feeling. I think if you play, you know, the thing is, if you don't make a mistake, like I, I because I'd made a mistake with the king ten early on, and it was stupid. Mm. I actually I spoke to myself and I said, right, look, just stop, you know, just play properly. You know, you know how to play properly. Uh, just play properly. 
And so I think because I played properly and it worked and it actually worked out in my favor, um, I felt I felt OK. I just wish I would have loved to have had um, I would have loved to have had like sort of 30 at some stage of the tournament. I would have liked to have had over 30 bigs at some stage <laughs> right. just to be able to play uh, and not having to limp on the button with King Queen suited because I had like I think I got up to like 23 bigs at one point and limped. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that hand. There was there was one hand where I limped on the button with king queen suited, uh, small blind folded, big blind was who was a French guy, uh, who had like seventy big blinds at that time, checked behind, and it came a king high board with two hearts. Uh, he checked, and I bet, you know, standard bet. I think I, th I think I actually bet fifty percent because it was you know because there were a few draws out there mm -hmm. and he called now it came the queen of spades on the turn making th me two pair and hit and uh the spade hit as well the spade the flush hit and for some reason i just i don't know i just didn't feel good about the t top two and so normally i'd play that really quite aggressively but anyway i checked behind he checked and i checked and then it came um it came Hold on, King Queen. It came a card on the river, which had I had an ace, I would have had the uh, the straight. Do you know what I mean? I can't remember right. what it So yeah. whatever it was. Um, he checked again, and I I didn't have the ace. I had two pairs, so I just checked behind, and it turned out that he actually had like two four of spades. So he'd made a he'd made a flush on the turn. Ah, uh, yes, I do remember that. Yeah. Did it, did uh, yeah? I don't know whether did it show my hands? Did it show my cards? No. Uh, it it didn't no. show second place, only uh, the winner. Yeah. So yeah, I thought see. so. So I had I had king queen of hearts. Uh, so it was quite. Um, I was quite pleased with the way I played that hand in the end. Because um, I could have gone broke. Yeah. Well, it seems like a couple times. Um, I wanted to ask you because to to some of the people from the newer generation of poker players, I would include myself in that. Um, you know, they may not be familiar with some of your past in, in the big tournaments. Um, what? That's disgraceful. What do you mean you're not familiar? You should, you know. <laughs> no, I, look, I agree. I've not been on the scene a lot. And I don't, I, I'm not a huge self-publicist like Phil Helmuth or, right. you know, or similar. Right. So <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if people didn't know who, who, who I was. Well, I, I think everyone in poker knows who you are, but they not, might not know that you won a million pounds uh, playing on the Isle of Man uh, in yeah. a tournament. You finished a runner-up to Mike Sexton in the 2003 European Heads-Up Championship. Yeah. Second place in uh, a W Coupe. Um, you, so w Coupe main event, the first one ever. So, like, mm -hmm. these are some pretty big games. And I'm curious as to... When you were playing back then, as opposed to like playing this event now, you know, it's 15 years later or so. How mm. has your your mindset changed in that environment? Uh, is it different or do you approach it really the same way? No, it has to. No, it's different. I, look, there's a lot of it. A lot of it I approach the same way. But I think my dif my um, awareness of other players at the table has changed dramatically because the game has changed so much. So. I do, I do pay it. I think I, I, I'm not saying I study a great deal, but I do watch videos and, and, uh, you know, I used to watch, I used to have like a run it once account. So I watch videos there that, you know, I really liked, um, the Lucas Greenwood's videos on there. I used to watch those a lot. I really mm -hmm. liked his, it, it was very informative. Uh, and it was, I think it was really important for me to understand what was going through guys heads uh and when people started talking about ranges you know specific ranges and you know utg plus one or whatever i started to you know look at okay what people sh possibly are opening with <laughs> here and you know what are they three betting with and three bet and the thing is you you you've probably seen it change even in the time that you've been playing is that things become more fashionable people start mm. you know i found myself limping on the button where I, there's no way i would have ever limped on the on the button with any any hand uh you know king queen some people would say well actually with 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 20 you know did i have 18 bigs or 20 bigs with king queen suited 
um, you should you should be raising all the time. And but I fancy had I raised with that hand, he'd have called. He was defended with two four suited, mm -hmm. I imagine. Um, and then I'd have, I'd be out probably be out of the tournament because it would have played a lot stronger then. Yeah, true. The whole hand, you know, I'd have bet you know pot. He'd probably call because he's. I don't. I probably wouldn't bet the pot. I'd probably bet about fifty-five percent or something. He'd call, and then uh, by this time I'm pot committed. I will, but I wasn't there. So I, I, I've learned. Yeah, no. The out to answer your question briefly. Yes, I've learned a lot from young, pl younger players, players younger than me who've who've studied it. You know, studied the game a lot more. And not only studied it, but they've also been. They've also had groups of friends. Uh, who they've, you know, they've either been swapping pieces with or they're in stables or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. where they actually, all they do is talk about poker, you know. So, like, when I was a guy, when I was, like, a 22 or 23-year-old, me and my mates, we talk about sort of sport and girls, you know. Right. These guys these guys go would go out and they'd all be sitting around at the Vic, you know, the seven or eight of them all discussing, you know, what, you know, what, uh, you know, what defense frequency is in this particular situation, you know. And, mm -hmm. and you, you're kind of going, <laughs> I kind of, uh, I kind of appreciate that and respect it. But also, uh, I also think... Um, for a, a player who's uh who doesn't have that group of friends you see it's funny because like i've got friends in poker like say barney you know barney boatman for instance i don't think barney and i've ever discussed a hand ever right uh, <laughs> you know you know what i mean that's yeah we, i don't think we've ever done that i mean we maybe we have in a you know i might have called him a fish calling in some situation and then he'll try to explain to me why he did it but um i don't i think it's it's a little bit Sometimes it's a bit off-putting if you're a, a lone player right. uh, to see groups of people talking about uh, hand ranges and, and strategy and things like that because you do feel a bit. But I've found that I've learned a great deal from players like that. Um, and hopefully uh, hopefully some of it's sunk in. I think, well, I think it has sunk in because I think it's very difficult to get deep in a tournament with one like players that. of that caliber yeah one like that very deep structure yeah. you know 20 20 minute levels the first day i think and then 30 minutes after that you know yeah. the the cream really rises to the crop there so well um, also it's just you have got to remember that james was is, is that you know i'm 61 years old now so i get kind of tired you know at 3 30 if it's 3 30 in the morning mm -hmm. and i haven't been I, and i haven't been working those hours which i don't normally i'm normally in bed by sort of half 11 then, then I can also get very tired. So, uh, actually, last night finished. It finished very quickly yesterday. Yeah, I thought. Mm -hmm. I don't know about what you thought about that, but I think given the money involved, five and a half I hours thought, total. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was really quick. Yeah, really, really quick to go down from twenty-seven players to, you know, to a winner. Yeah, uh, it was. It was. Uh, you know, it was incredibly quick. I like that format of uh, oh, yeah, me playing too. less hours but more days. I think that's smart for for everyone involved, you know. Um, oh, definitely. I think it's really it's really really uh, favorable. And I'm not saying I didn't like it last night. I really I really enjoyed it because you know it was like I would hope so by one o'clock. You know, it was great. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was a classic. It was a classic situation where you had three or four players who had really you know stacks. Right. And a lot and a lot and a lot of other players that just didn't have stacks. And it was very it was just very difficult because just people were just getting knocked out. But the thing is, experience that's the other thing is experience does give you that awareness. So, you know, I would always have the other table. Certainly when we got down to two tables, I would always have the other table open. I'd be looking at what was going on there, what was happening there, uh, in the same way that you would if you were in my situation like that. Right. And just um, and just laddering up and looking at all the ICM implications. But people were just, the big sacks, quite rightly, were playing quite aggressively and opening much wider than, uh, than you know, especially on money bubbles. You yeah. know, it was, it was great. I really enjoyed it, you know, and learned a lot from it yesterday as well. So the, the day after now, um, you know, uh, almost 900,000 first place score. And I talked to you a little <laughs> bit this, about this before, but it's a very common yeah. question that I get. Like, what would you do if you, if you had that big of a score? So I'm curious as to where is your mind today in regards to like the money that comes along with a score like that? The only, the only thing I'm thinking about is the election and the foreign currency exchange rates. That's all I'm thinking <laughs> right. about. So all I'm do, all I'm trying to do at the moment is, is just, uh, 
uh, leverage half of it immediately into sterling so that to, because then the, I, I don't know which way it's going to go i suspect right. that the, the pound will get stronger on uh, tomorrow uh, or should i say friday after the results but you know it, so i just want to i just want to be i don't i hate i hate gambling on exchange rates so yeah. i'll just convert 50 percent of it immediately then work out what to do with it afterwards i don't know what i'm going to do i mean I think uh, it's you know look it's a fair amount it's a fair amount of money um, I haven't I haven't really thought about it money comes and money goes you know it's not a, I don't I don't really value money as much as I probably did when I was younger um, it just it is what it is it's it's I'm I'm very fortunate enough to be comfortable you know I've got you know. I've got a, a you know, a couple of house. You know, I've got a house in London and a house here, and I, I very, I'm, I'm comfortable. So mm -hmm. I don't, uh, I don't really know what you know what I'll do with it. Right. I suspect I'll probably, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'll do with it. I, I think it's a really cool mindset, and I see a, a big difference in a lot of professional players and then newer players coming into the game. And that I find new players really are in pursuit of that that big score and that life changer. Whereas the people that are pro players, you know, and even may not have found themselves in a comfortable spot in life yet, you know, their, their plan with a big score is, is typically very different than the amateur, which is like, yeah. I'll grow my bankroll or I'm going to invest it or, you know, the, the day after is going to be the same. So I was just mm. curious if, if that was the case with you as well. Um, Cause I think it's illuminating to, to a newer player. So was it always yeah, like that? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, when I know when I when I won the million when I won the poker million, I think that was for me at that particular time. It was really that was really life changing because I was pretty broke. You know, I was directing a TV drama for Channel Four. I was editing a show for Channel Four. What year you was this? Get, huh? What year was this? Um, two thousand. Two thousand. Okay. Yeah, two thousand. Right. So I was I, I was directing and we were editing this show and um uh anyway i went to play i went to play this tournament but i was broke i, I really didn't have any money i'd borrowed heavily to buy a house my children i had two kids they were both very young um and i didn't i really wasn't earning enough money uh you know to you know i had a really heavy mortgage on the house it was you know it was very difficult you know life time was hard and so for me, poker was at the time, poker was really a hobby because it was something I got into purely because when you're directing TV drama, you might, if you're lucky, you would work nine months of the year if you were very lucky. Right. More often than not, it would be like six, seven, eight months of the year. So during the off, you know, during the downtime, I, I want, I always wanted to have sort of a hobby. Um, and, and I bumped in, you know, I just, saw some guys at the Victoria Casino when I was playing blackjack one day and that's how I really got into it and learned about it and that was god knows when 1990s probably yeah about not in the 1990s early 1990s and um anyway so when I won that tournament it was it would made a significant change it meant I could pay off the debts on the house uh put money away to educate the kids uh and really I, I could breathe, I, you know, it made, a, it made a massive difference. If you look at, say, Phil Galfon, Jason, you know, J, J, Jason Kuhn, all these, all these players, Brian Rast, all mm -hmm. of them, if you look at them all, Robel, you know, whoever, you go, these guys, they're just never going to go, they're, ne they're no. never going to go completely broke because they're not stupid, you know. They're never going to expose themselves to that, that much, you know. You know, if they if they want to get, if they're going to have to play in a really really big game, then they're going to spread the they're going to spread the risk amongst backers. You know, they're not going to take on all the risks themselves. You know, they're they're astute and, and sensible. Mm. You know, I just I'm just quite content to walk the dogs and play poker. And also, the great thing about poker is if you you know you you can play it as a complete game of skill and you can control it and if you you know if you can play within your bankroll this is such a crucial thing you know it's so crucial 
you know, to, to look at, you know, to go and say, take, go and have a look at Jonathan Little's bankroll, you know, videos and say, look, you know, how much, what, what level should, if I've got $100 in my account, and I'm, you know, I'm sort of 18 years old, I'm, and I, I want to learn to play poker, I want to put $100 in, you know, what, le what size game should you be playing in? Should I, should I, such, should I sit down in a 50 cent $1 game? No, of course not. Right, yeah. You know, you've got to you've got to start really, really small. And for me, I would immediately sit down. You know, I just remember the full tilt days where I would just I would deposit sort of five k onto full tilt, spin it up to two hundred and fifty k, and then try and find an even bigger game, just to to, to just just you know to you know the five hundred one k hold you know hold them game there just to try to spin it up into two million you know this is right. this is what my life was like i was just constantly trying to uh just keep spinning my life up <laughs> <laughs> it, it's and a different you, world back then like we we've yeah. changed so much do you miss that that feeling of poker like the somewhat degenerate on the edge craziness no no, no, no it's better now I look. I, I miss the laughter and the fun and the the, the joviality mm. that went with that, you know. And right. uh, and the thing is, you've got also the way that I used to play, and still to some extent now. Whenever I want, if ever I want a game, uh, in a lie, I can get into any game anywhere in the world, Jamie. Right. Any any game. I seriously. believe it. <laughs> I honestly can get into any fucking game anywhere. Yeah. Because people know. They, they, they might say they might think oh he's calmed down a bit but just you wait all he has to do is get one bad beat right. <laughs> he, he's back to the old john again you know yeah and it's kind of true so i have to be really that's why i have to be quite careful if i make a score like i did yesterday you know in the old days i wouldn't be having this conversation with you i'd be playing four tables of 50 100 game, yeah. on 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 party <laughs> if i let try well actually the thing is, the, the irony is, is that I could probably get four tables of 50, yeah. 100 going on party, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, they'd never run there normally, but I, I, if I just sat down there now, I'm sure, I'm sure it would. They'd fill up, I happen. think. Yeah. Maybe one, one or two tables. I don't know. So with that experience over time of, of um, going through playing poker for 20 years and, and having the ups and downs, um, you know, poker's a very young player base now, on average. So do you think there's anything that I'll say we are missing as a younger generation that maybe we didn't get a chance to experience and, and we're missing out on? I think one of my, one of my, I remember having this sort of crisis moment uh, maybe 10 years ago about over the EPT and over my endorsing poker stars and all that sort of stuff. And I was really worried that um, I was really wor worried that there was a whole generation of really highly intelligent young men and some women who were dedicating their life to a game which was just all purely about money and not doing anything uh, and not doing anything at all of any value in life. And then suddenly I saw a sort of change in uh, in that sort of in the di in the dynamic of the, or the the sort of the zeitgeist within the poker community, which was that I think players who'd got to maybe they'd been playing for five, six, seven years, had got to the age of about twenty five, twenty six, suddenly started to realise that they they too had started to realize that what they were doing with their lives you know 25 26 and so they started to do things outside of poker or they started to take other interests the, the first thing that happened was that they started to look after their bodies better mm. suddenly you'd see people guys you know working out uh so, suddenly uh, you went to vegas and you sit at a poker table and it was all just tiny heads on huge body you know right. huge yeah. muscly bodies yeah and you go what the hell's happened here you know everybody looked like alex fox and you know yeah it was kind of it was kind of crazy but then you thought well actually that's good that's a really good thing um, and once people had done that with their 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 physical appearance, because I remember you, I remember you back, you know, back in the day when you you changed, you, yes. you changed the way you looked. You went through a very dramatic mm -hmm. change in you know in your in your appearance. You lost a hu huge amount of weight. Yeah. All credit to you. I mean, I've never, I fortunately have never had that that issue, that problem. And so, but I really respect and admire people that have 
that have managed to achieve that. So, so really well done. But that that was going on throughout a lot of young people. So for sure, okay. the health bug okay. in okay. poker was, was exactly. big. Yeah, it was big. But then going back to your question about whether whether people are missing out, they look. I think there are some players. There are some players. I, there are a couple of players, poker players, who've come to me who want to learn how to edit, for instance, and di direct and edit. Um, you know, I've spoken to them because it. And some one of them. One of them has actually gone off and made started making really interesting documentaries. You know, very good poker player, but who realised that actually he needed to do something else with his life as well as play poker. Mm. Um, I think he he's focusing much more on the documentaries now than on the poker, and that's fine. But he may still play. He may not. He may just say, actually, I never want to see a card again in my life. I've sp I spent eight years of my life doing this. I've got, you know, I've managed to buy myself a house. That's fine. I think I'm going to go into business now. I'm going to sell, uh, you know, ice cream. I'm, I'm going to set up a small business doing, you know, whatever weed. You know, mm, but yeah. but um, I think that. Uh, um, I don't think I don't think people have missed out on on anything because I, I was worried about it at first and and then and then you know you know what made me really feel better about it was that I think that without mentioning any names I think that there were quite a number quite a large number of poker players young poker players who I recognised that poker actually gave them so much more because. They, they were patently, I'm not going to say that they were, they were patently had issues about how they socialized and how they dealt with people. Mm -hmm. So some would say they were they had Asperger's or some would say, you know, that there would, could be issues with uh, autism, things like that, borderline, uh, uh, some, 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 some guys, you know, uh, and I watched them grow and I watched some of these guys grow and become really quite confident at the tables because they obviously had started playing online you know right uh they'd found a game that they you know and then they started playing online and then i they would appear and they'd come into a casino somewhere and you'd, you'd see them and they'd be just terrified you know they'd be sitting there they would never talk to anybody mm. and slowly but surely over maybe two three four five years i've watched a lot of these guys young kids grow so I think poker's provided a huge. Um, I think that's. I think that's something that it's provided um, for a specific group of young, uh, young men. Um, yeah. uh, I don't know whether you are, have ever thought about that, but I think I know I have. Yeah, I. I mean, something that made me really fall in love with it and pursue it in a big way was in my hometown. You know, a town of eighty thousand people, relatively conservative small town in Canada. Uh, and I would go play poker at the casino, just $1, $2, I could buy in for 500 max. Um, and like you said, I was terrified, you know, hands shaking when I first got in there, I was freaking out. But I, I ended up playing this uh, pot limit Omaha game. It was dealer's choice, mm. but everyone choose PLO, maybe a little PLO eight. And I was sitting at a table and I found myself, you know, beside the biggest land developer in town, you know, a retired dentist, uh, a working doctor. And then also, you know, with probably a pimp, you know, uh, yeah. a guy that sells drugs, like it, just everyone from it's different cultures. It's a classless well. arena. It's a wonderful classless arena of uh, people. It is. Yeah. It, it's universal language in the same way that music is in that we can mm. come together. These people that I would never have the opportunity to engage with or talk with unless I found myself in their, you know, uh, culture or their, their class in life. But we all came together and we communicated. So that was an opportunity for me to, to, to learn about other ways of doing things and other ways of thinking. I think that's so amazing about poker. It's like one of the aspects that isn't appreciated enough by non-poker players, how cool that experience is. So um, I think that was a, a big learning, learning process for me doing that. What I love about poker, live poker, is that you can go and play poker in what in any mood you're in you can if you don't want to talk to people you don't have to talk to people yeah. if you're if you're manic and you're crazy and you what you want to go and have a really good time people you know you can have a really good time and people will you know entertain you and you can entertain them and nobody cares what mood you're in you can be famous you can be you know you can be in t street smart you can be uh, educated it doesn't matter. It makes no difference. You, you know, you just have this wonderful group of people. And that's still 
that's still the case, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the only thing that has probably changed is that there aren't as many characters as there used to be when I sort of first went there. You right. know, in the... The first time, you know, when I was first at the Vic, and you know, it was, you know, there would be such a wonderful selection of uh, criminals, uh, actors, writers, you know, lawyers, doctors, you know, all this bunch of people. But mm -hmm. a lot of them had real sparkly characters. Uh, a lot of them were as dodgy as fuck, and you have to be really careful, right. you know, around them. Uh, and the cheating that went, you know, it, because it, there were self-deal games. I remember my first self-deal game was with this group of guys, and you you dealt the you dealt you know you dealt yourself, right? And That's some crazy. and guys would literally they turn over their in seven card we would play seven card stud. They turn over their hand, they go straight, turn that scoop the pot in, and turn their hand over before you even could <laughs> see if they'd had a straight or not, you know, and shuffle it all into the deck, and you right. go what what the. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it was kind of it was it was a very steep learning curve. I can tell you right now, but I really enjoyed it, and I still see some of those guys now. Yeah, yeah, it, it still exists. I think to your point earlier about you know the poker bubble of having friends that play poker. I can think back to myself being twenty one, twenty two. That's all I wanted to talk about too, because poker was like my ability to to make something of myself and and have an opportunity. So that's all I was interested in talking about or doing. So at the yeah. table, all I talked about was poker, and that's kind of annoying if you play poker for fun. You know, <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to talk about strategy or ranges or or get ridiculed about things. So, um, what you know, other interest? What other interests do you do? Do you have or have you had or? Um. So I wanted to be a professional golfer growing up. So that yeah. was like five or six years. I kind of full time trying to become Tiger Woods, realized at 18, yeah. that wasn't going to happen. You know, I wasn't Tiger. So yeah, Thanks. golf, golf was the thing for me, uh, for like about six years. Uh, it's kind of sad realizing I wasn't going to make it. So I got into partying, you know, going out, drinking, smoking, you know, hanging out with <clears> girls <throat> for about six or seven months. Um, and then I found poker. So I, I've been like very obsessive, obsessive personality, like one track most of my life. And most of my struggles are trying to figure out how to balance. But it, mm. it's been really golf, party egg, and then poker for the last 10 years. Um, Which is nice. It's nice. It's a, it's a nice thing to do. Mm. Um, and do, do you do you have, I mean, I know it's not, it's not me interviewing you, but I, I just think it's interesting because I'm a great believer in reinventing yourself because I've, I've done so many things in my life. Um, poker's always been on the peripheral. You know, I've... <clears throat> You know, I've done so many things business wise and I just really like the idea of reinventing yourself every five years. Hmm. And, you know, like at the moment I'm trying to work out what to do next, you know, poker, I'll always, I'll, I'll always have I'll be involved in poker, but the, you know, a couple of years ago I went back to directing drama and did a Netflix and ITV uh, drama series or did the last two episodes of the series. Oh, wow. I didn't know and that. really got yeah, and really got into it again, uh, and was starting to think, well, actually, maybe I'll just maybe I'll do a film uh, of something. You know, maybe I'll do a film of my own where I actually want it's about something that I want to make a film about, rather than directing things for other people. You know, or maybe I'll do something altogether different. I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I set up a company with my son, one of my sons. You know, I don't know. So, um, I, I had this idea the other day. I think it would be a really nice idea to deliver, you know, water in the same, you know, to fresh water to people, rather than using plastic bottles of water. Just have everybody have gas. Uh, sorry, have uh, glass uh, bottles in their houses. You know, right. large bottle. You know, large. Um, what do they call water coolers? Mm. You know, and, and just get rid of plastic using plastic altogether in in water I th 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 these sort of things so I'm always, I'm always i'm always trying to work out what to do next and i think it's nice i think it's good to do that i think it's really uh refreshing to always be looking forward because right. you never you can't get old if you always look forward i think for me the definition of old age is when you start looking back um mm. you know you should always be looking for new ideas um and I, I certainly had no intention of getting back into the poker 
business post EPT. You right. know, the EPT had taken up a lot of my life and uh, I had no intention of doing that. And that's really why I'd gone back into directing, mm -hmm. you know, but when when Tom Waters and, and Rob Young and uh, other, another couple of guys from phoned me up, um, had this call in January three years ago, I, you know, I just thought, well, I really, you know, I like these guys, you know, particularly like Rob um, uh, and, you know, and Tom. But I didn't know Tom. I knew I've known Rob for a long for a long time and I've always liked him. Uh, Tom, Tom, I didn't know very well, but I really like Tom. I think he's such a nice guy and really, mm. really, you know, hardworking, very creative, loves the game uh, and has surrounded himself with some really dedicated people, you know, at Party Poker. And likewise, Rob at Party Poker Live, right. and um, so that's really that. That was the reason I got back into it. Um, and you know, I really don't do that much. You know, I mean, I'm I'm much more of a figurehead with Party Poker Live. I don't, uh, I don't do, I don't really do a great deal. They don't, it's, it's not like they're on the phone to me every single day asking where we should go, what we should do, which venue, you know, what about this venue and that venue. They, they they will they picked my brains for the first year or two and then realized it was probably all a bit stale <laughs> <laughs> and decided to just do it themselves you know so but they uh occasionally occasionally uh, rob and i will have discussions about things um but uh look he's a he's a great guy and he i think he you know he's he, he actually got a bit, there was some he was getting a bit of grief actually last week i don't know if you saw it, it was some guy um who's gone on about party poker scamming. Did yeah. you see that thing? That yeah, was... I saw that. There was a, a blog yeah. post where he he wrote, you know, party poker scam question mark or something like that. Um, yeah, and then Rob, resp Rob reacted in a sort of, <laughs> look, what, 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 you know, what, what appeared to, to, to other people, it would seem like a really arrogant way to say, right, okay, look, you know, I'll pay you, I'll pay you your money back and just, I'll mm -hmm. just take you off the site. Now, what, what you have to realize, if you know, if you know, Rob, I think I know Rob well enough to know that he's not doing that from his own point of view. He's doing that because he knows that there are hundreds of people working really hard to try to make party poker better. Right. No, obviously they're paid to do that and they're trying to do it for the, you know, because they love it. But, but a, a, the majority of them really love the game and they want it to be, you know, they want to make it better. And I think Rob is very good at defending people who are very loyal to him. Okay. Right. And that's something I really admire about people. And he, his, his reaction there is just absolute loyalty to his staff and the people that work around him and the people that work for party poker as well. Mm -hmm. And his that his anger and his his, his knee jerk reaction there is all about that. Now I don't know what's happened since then. I think there was some there's been some griping that some guy yeah. Philip what's his name from ACR has been going yeah. on about it trying to capitalize on it. Now look a ACR are doing what whatever ACR do they do, you know. The venues mm -hmm. are obviously very popular people like that. That's fine. Just get on do do you just mind your own house and get on with and run a business you the way that you want to do it you know and we we just will do what we carry on doing you know uh it was just one of those things and so look it's not it's not an ego thing it's just a protecting his uh his his uh his peer group yeah, uh, and yeah. I, I respect him for that and uh, you know it's good yeah, yeah to give a little context to anyone that missed that there was a player that uh, was playing satellites after they already won a seat to day one A, uh, unaware that they couldn't win a additional seat to day one oh, A yeah, yeah, with the satellites. Yeah. So that was the thing, um, and and basically that's been in the terms of service for about six months now on other events. But I see the point of not being able to know that if you haven't played a lot on party poker over the last six months. So I get that point. Uh, mm. You know, so the player released the the blog saying party poker scam, uh, mm. and Rob said. No, you're right. You shouldn't be able to register if you already have a seat. I thought that was going to be fixed, but it wasn't. So I'm going to refund yeah. you 10000 from my own pocket. But because you released this blog post calling us a scam, I've asked them to close your account following following mm. your play of, of day 1A. Um, since then, it seems like everything's been squashed. He learned from some players that this guy is okay. So everything mm. seems fine between the two of them, and it's all set. But yeah. to me, I thought that was... Uh, 
and I've known Rob for not very long, you know, like uh, mm. eight months. But coming into this environment, I see like he has this group of people that are very passionate around him, like you said, and like he's worked with for a long time and he trusts and he believes in. Yeah. Um, and, and that was like a live poker response to me, which is if you run a club and someone comes into your club and says, this is shit, you know, I, I don't like mm. any of you. I don't like this. We're just like, okay, mm. well, then don't come back here. You're not welcome. Yeah. That makes sense yeah. to me. You know, whereas online, as an online provider, people are like, what do you mean? You know, this is an internet yeah. company. Like I, you know, so, so that, that I have a, reaction I have was... A, I, have a, I have a right to play here. Exactly. I have a right. Yeah. Don't, you, don't you think, though, the thing that I actually find quite pathetic, though, is I don't know the guy. I, can't even, I don't even know the guy's name. But the thing is, what I don't like about is, is, is about, the, so it's a generational thing, is that there are some people that will just go on to social media and start literally bleating and blame, you know, mm -hmm. going on about companies because I don't know they've 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 lost the, 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 some ticket issue at American Airlines or something. Yes, they suddenly go on and they say scam, scamming this and scamming that. Um, just deal with it. Deal with it with the company themselves. I think the, there's a, there's an issue. This is this shaming. This whole thing about shaming, or mm. it's, it's a little bit like people sticking their hand up in the classroom you know of the teacher it's just not a good look guys you know mm. it just doesn't look good it doesn't make you look good it, you look a, you look kind of kind of pathetic i think uh you know with that sort of behavior i think you should just go direct to a company and just say look this happened don't try and shame them right yeah well and, and does it accomplish the the you know what is the end goal as well you know like what what do you get equity wise out of out of shaming a company you know is it going to get you any money or is it uh, i often think about that as well like if you well, have an issue attention isn't it to get money for yourself it's not yeah. to it's, you're not really doing it for other people you're yeah. just doing it for yourself yeah yeah so um that did happen thankfully it seems like everything is sort of sorted but uh i share mm. your sentiments on that um so uh, i should let you go pretty soon but uh, given that you have such an extensive history in uh, producing and editing. I wanted to get your thoughts on today's poker content. You know, that's something I'm in, and, and I think there's a lot of attention today on Twitch and YouTube <clears throat> when it comes to, you know, getting the word out about poker. It's very different than how things were back when you were, you know, the head of the EPT and producing those shows. Mm. Um, it's, it's not centralized. It's a lot cheaper, it's faster, it's quick, and it's person to person. So what do you think about today's poker content? Um, yeah. <clears throat> and, and where should it go from here, in your opinion, if you could run it, what's gonna be most effective? I think it's a very difficult one because I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, I, I think it's very, look, I think it's really, really, it's really, really tough um, because back in the day, okay, when, when the EPT and WPT started, um, poker was everybody with every channel, you know, travel the tra as soon as the travel channel got WPT, everybody started watching. It was fascinating. Well, actually, it's, let's start with late night poker here. Late night poker in the UK. Mm. Um, Is that where you walked down was, the stairs? That one? Was, was it that cash? Uh, no, no. It was where literally it was on at midnight um, and it was, a, it was a cash game uh, and it was. Uh, on Channel Four, I think it was in 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 England, and it had all these personalities on it, like Devilfish and Pete the Bandit, and all these all these great characters, Simon Trumper, uh, uh, and, and Barney Boat. I think Barney, you know Barney. All these all these all these players, and uh, it was just fascinating to watch. People were sitting there smoking at the tables. Now, obviously, nobody knew what was really going on, and, and it was in, so it was interesting. And it, it used to get a million viewers uh, then, you know, which was a lot of viewers at midnight yeah. on, a, <laughs> yeah. on a single channel. So, and then the Travel Channel came along, and obviously WPT was great. It suddenly made poker really uh, exciting. It made it like a game show. It was all everybody was wanting to learn the game, and suddenly on it combined with online poker everybody could do it it was all this huge perfect storm type situation uh poke you know Pete, the travel channel was buying the content you know then uh and then uh and then 
uh, after after a while, all these channels like Fox FSN and uh, all the channels here in the UK, they suddenly cottoned onto the fact that actually all these online poker sites were competing against each other for marketing. You know, marketing they they wanted to get on television with their brand. Mm. And so they started charging huge amounts of money to get, they didn't, you know, you never got paid. Post 2005, no channel paid for t- poker content. Right. The, the, it was all advertiser funded. So it was all paid for. EPT paid for 100% by poker stars, 100%. The uh, getting it onto the channel, you, you, you had to commit to ad- advertising on the channel to get your program on so you either had to pay for advertising during the breaks or you had to pay for the break bumpers either side of the show wow. all this sort of crap started going on it was in and so uh people were having to pay huge sums of money to get their product onto the television uh, here and in the us so but it was but the quality everybody wanted to watch it then everybody was interested in watching it then it then it then it all changed and viewing figures went right down and even the channels couldn't really justify having these programs on because nobody was watching them nobody mm. cares anymore about nobody your average viewer in the uk if you went around the streets now nobody really gives a shit about watching poker on television even poker players don't really want to watch poker on television mm. what they do want to watch i think is is the content it's really good content where the commentary is so crucial you know the you really have got to have top draw commentators uh discussing absolutely in detail what the thought processes of every single player at the table in this particular situation right it used to be just ace king against jacks all in oh wow babe but you know clap every guns and oh what a great hand you know uh that's changed now you can't do that anymore mm. it, you have to go into the thought the market is now players you know you've got 100 million people that have played poker at some time in their lives throughout the world that's a that's a pretty big uh that's a potential huge potential audience for a streaming site like poker go for instance mm. but you know, in order to keep people interested, you've got to you've got to make the content really, really not only really high quality, and I think they're doing a great job with some of their secondary content as well. I think some of the documentaries they have, the life stories, uh, you know, some of the, the even the dramas they're doing is you know are, are good. They're they're really good. They I think you know Maury and the, all the guys at Poker Go are trying to do a really are doing a really good job there. Um, but as a business model, does it work? I don't know. Right. I just I don't do, how many people are going to subscribe to it for the whole year I don't know it can't be that it can't be that many and um do, will 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 a poker site pay to be on poker go if they know that only you know I don't know how how many how many people are watching it you yeah, know I don't know yeah, I'm not you sure. know really you need to know and that's that's what that's the value of something so it needs it's going to change and i think it's i think that it'll become a niche product um for people in the same way that the golf channel is you know for people who watch mm. the golf channel watch golf uh i don't know if there's a chess channel or something like that but any any sort of hobby i think it'll just become like that and that that uh people will watch it but you have to in order to keep people interested you have to be you have to have really good commentary and i think um i think they do a good job and i think getting getting people in who really know what they I, you know i like you know without blowing smoke up your ass i like listening to you talking about you know about hands um you know and i think it's important you know there was one point because i was last night i was watching you and my, um talking about the i remember getting quite angry at one point the director in me was coming out right because because you you were talking about new you and money you were talking about new york when there was a hand on in the background yeah. and i was saying for fuck's sake start talking about the hand will you <laughs> this is really interesting and i was going and you were you were going waff, both of you were well actually money Mon, Mon, was waffling on about new york and eventually i turned the sound down i was getting so angry yeah yeah <laughs> and i was going and so that was that was the director in me just saying that you know so it's really important that people talk about, um, about because people want to learn. I want to learn, mm. you know. 
if I'm going to pay a subscription to watch poker, I'm not watching it to see Antonio Sfandiari, bless him, and Phil Lack throw eggs at each other or roll on the floor. You know, it's all, <laughs> that's all been done before. It just, it, the, the, nobody wants to see that anymore. Mm. You know, the entertainment, it just doesn't happen. You know, if you're watching Rob's game last night, I, did, I watched a bit of it. All right, so it's okay, you know. But there's only, you only get a few funny guys on there. You know, Randall Emmett is a funny, I like Randall, he's a funny guy. I like him. I think he's really entertaining. But really, uh, I watched a little bit of it last night. And frankly, I was I got bored. Rob mm. will hate me for saying this, but I just got bored. I didn't I didn't really enjoy what I was watching. I just thought I just I'm not learning anything here. You know, I'm not right. I'm not learning anything. And I want to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a poker game now to learn. So you need to look at the content you're making for your audience. And if your audience is are paying a subscription based uh, audience, they're, they're doing that because they want to learn more about the game, okay? And they, if they want to, if they, if they want to subscribe to the, if they want to laugh and have fun. They'll subscribe to the comedy channel. Right now, I think now I think people want to learn about the game. Of course, you can have some entertainment as well. Mm. That that I think is the future of of, of uh, streamed poker content. Is, is, okay, that's very interesting. That's my, that's my opinion, anyway. Yeah. No, I. I... And I think I would have gone counter to that before I had this conversation with you, but it gives me a lot of thought because to me, I thought learning was, and, and there's a lot of concern in poker about learning being not approachable. You know, when you talk about higher level poker concepts that can be scarier to a new, newer audience, that's at least what you hear a lot. You know, streamers talk about that a lot as well. Um, but what you're saying makes a lot of sense in that people want to improve. Um, mm. So it's an, it's an interesting dynamic of how do you how do you allow the audience to improve and what level do you set that at to where it can be understood but how do you go so in depth that it's more interesting than you know like the the banter at the table or something that we've all seen before um, well, i think it's really difficult but mm -hmm. you know the i hate stalling but you know for the sake of it but i watched a, a high stakes game on poker go a few months ago i think there were jason coon there was a lot of some other guys it was a really interesting lineup Okay, really interesting, and there were a lot of there were certain there were certain periods of that that uh, broadcast, which were apps for me were fascinating because there was the, people had pe people had a very significant decision to make, right, and so there was a lot of you know maybe it was two three four minutes of thinking time, mm. right. And um, what was happening, which what was interesting was that Nick Shulman, uh, Nick, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, he was he was come he was providing this wonderful sort of commentary, very laconic commentary about the thought process that maybe was going through Jason Kuhn's brain at this particular moment. I loved this. It was really, really dramatic. It was re it really mm. worked for me as a poker player, as a subscriber. I want to see more of that. I don't right. want to see, I'm really sorry, I don't want to see old high stakes poker lineups. I don't want to see this crap anymore. I've seen enough of it. I think it's, I think it's, um, the, the, I think people are making mistakes thinking that we're going to get more people into this by having these the people being clowns on, 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 right. on TV. Mm. It's gone. It's gone. That's, that, it was great when it happened. I think. People like Antonio, Phil Lack, they did a great job back in the day, all right? They did a really good job, and they made poker fascinating. They drew a lot of people in. Daniel does the same. Daniel's great, in, you know, mm -hmm. on, on a, a live for live poker, or, you know, it was. But I think, um, I think even Daniel's starting to go, be, be thinking more about the game itself and talking about no re-entries and things like that. Um, you know, I think he's even he... Look... I mean, I actually am a big, look, I go hot and cold on Daniel. Sometimes he really annoys me and sometimes I really, really like him. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, you know, I was watching his blog from the uh, WSOPE. I don't know if you watched any of Yeah, I watched a few, yeah. I really like his blogs. I mean, I got really angry with him at one point when he was going on about smoking because I was still smoking then. You know? right. <laughs> and, yeah. and I was saying, you can't spit at the camera like that, Dan. You know, he's spitting at the camera. And I was saying, my God, man, what are you doing? You're, you're like a fuck, you're like a man possessed. You've gone psychotic, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, but then later in the in the series, you'll see him go, 
look, okay, I know people know I go crazy when, about smoking. I go psychotic. I go get ma- a bit mad. But like he talks about, he he's entertaining because he talks about what he feels strongly about. Okay, um, and sometimes you know, and I kind of. You know, there are times when he's doing it, uh, he's, when he's entertaining, there are times, I think he's better than he used to be. I think there were a few years ago, I think he became, a, he, he, I, he'd probably say it himself, he was a bit of a dick sometimes. Uh, but now I think he's, uh, he was quite, I actually find him quite likable during the yeah. WSOPE blogs. They were good. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I agree. I I have a lot of respect for Daniel just because I, I don't think I'd be playing poker if it wasn't for him, you know, like I yeah. read his books and stuff. So... You know, I don't agree with a lot of his takes. I used to be a smoker as well. I quit about five months ago. And I, mm. I've seen him tweet some things like, uh, you know, about smokers that basically like, and I was just like, wow, okay. I take that as a personal attack, you know? I didn't know it's such a terrible person. Uh, you know, and I just well, no, really, it's really, you're like the devil. It's yeah. incarnate. I yeah. mean, yeah. Yeah. it's really mm-hmm. the spitting at the camera that I just literally, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I was just absolutely horrified. But, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I, I also don't like the, the flip side, which is, you know, so many of the younger generation <laughs> of players just like trying to tear into them week after week after month after month after year. Yeah, because boring. I think, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's too much. And coming from golf, there's this level of respect that is earned from people that that have put in their time and their dues. Um, mm. And to me, he's one of those people that deserves a minimum level of, of respect for what he's done for the game and stuff. So I always carry that yeah. around in regards. To I him. agree. I absolutely agree with you there completely. And I think he he he. What boy does he wear it well? I couldn't hack that constant barrage of hatred from some right. people. I, yeah. I'm far too thin skinned to you know. I just get very. I just switch off. You know. Yeah. I think yeah. I just get off. I'd get off Twitter. I'd get off social media altogether. I'd say right. I've, I can't be bothered with this. Tap out, yeah. But he, battle, he, or something. Yeah. he battles on, you know. He doesn't. Yeah. He's. He's. I admire him for that. For heaven's sake, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, amazing. John, I uh, I should let you go. We've been talking for just over an hour now, but I really appreciate you taking the time uh, and and speaking no, with great. me. I thought it was awesome. Huge congrats on your fifth place yesterday as well. Thank you very much. I mean, awesome. it was it was fun, and thank you for providing giving me some company while i was playing you know it was nice to i I like what i've realized i like doing is is actually watching uh twitch streamers whilst i'm playing on a sunday because i really only play on a sunday now right um or tend to or big tournaments and um for me it's really nice to watch people like you um well so i watch jeff you know uh, you know, it's. I think it's quite, it's quite comforting. You know, even you know sometimes I watch you know Lex because I find Lex quite entertaining. You know, right. I think it's very funny. And I, you know, I don't look. Okay, so he bats for the other team. That doesn't worry me. You know, because yeah. I really like Lex as a person. You know, you know my my uh, my feelings for you. Know, look, I don't. I my own feeling is that party poker is going to dominate this the poker industry within the next two years. That's what I am hoping because that's what we want, you know. That's what we want to do, and we love the game. And uh, you know, we just need to just carry on going the way we're going. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, maybe Lex will be with us. Who knows? In a few years' time, yeah, let's you never hope. know. I'm a big Lex fan too. As roommates, he's he's a great guy. So, oh, you were his roommate. We, we lived together for a little while in Costa Rica. Yeah, we did a bit of travel. Okay. Two years I ago. never knew that. Yeah. No, he's a very I'm a big fan. I've always I've always liked him. He's good fun. Yeah. It's a good you know. community out there. You know, no matter what team you're you're working with, like all of us streamers are friends generally and uh you know, Yeah. It's just uh it's good that there's competition now, you know. It was um very one sided, you know, poker stars had the market completely and no one was really investing in the space. So, you know, party poker and recently G G and Natural Eights, you know, are starting to invest and it's it's just healthy mm-hmm. for everyone. So um, and it's a great skill, actually, as well. I mean, I I tried to do it once. <laughs> my chat told me this. Why don't you get out there? Oh no, that could you be the know, next I've five years. Known, and it, you know, the, for, first of all, I couldn't, I couldn't bear the idea of just chatting into thin air right. <laughs> when they were like, I could see that three people <laughs> were watching, yeah. and I didn't even, I didn't even know if they spoke English. Right. <laughs> and I just thought. 
what the hell? You know, there's no, there was no, I was getting no feedback. And I thought, what, what, why am I, you know, I, cause I, I considered uh, twitching yesterday's, um, you know, play. Right. And then I thought, well, actually, there's a lot of money involved here. I, and mm. for me, it's very, dist- I find it really distracting. There's something wrong with my setup here, which, which means that when I've got OBS running, it all gets, it, everything starts playing up a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's sort of, it's suddenly, because I've got three screens, it suddenly starts to slow down and things start to jerk around a bit when, when I'm <laughs> streaming. So I just thought, actually, I can't be bothered with it. Um, and also I live in the country, so I've got to switch to, I've got to, I can't, you know, my broadband doesn't work. So I've got to switch to like a 4G dual, dual SIM card setup that I've got here just right. as a backup, you know, it's all a bit fiddly, but, um, boy, it's hard work, mate. I, I take my hat off to you. I think it's really, it's really difficult to do, you know, it's a lot of for, so many, for so many hours, you yeah. know, I don't know how you do it. You do it really well, by the way. Cheers. Thank you. I mean, that's that's where the talking from New York comes from. That's why we have to talk about not poker, because sometimes you just can't you can't drone drone on about poker for five hours. It's too much. I know? agree. But I think when there's a hand going on in the background, which is a significant hand, I think <laughs> yeah. you have to. You spotted it, by the way. Yeah. You, by the, if you remember, you probably remember it. Yes, you I do remember. It, yeah. You yeah. Suddenly, you, your instinct came up and said, you know, straight, you, you know, you had the instinct as well. It was Mona. It was a bless her. She was just waffling on about shopping on, you know, shopping in Bloomingdale's or something like that. I don't right, know. It was, right. Yeah. At some point this year, we're going to get cards up replays uh, on party poker. So when that happens, it'll yeah. be a lot. You know, we'll be able to spot big hands before they come. <laughs> so. I think that'll be much more. It'll be much more interesting with, you know, with having cards, having cards up yes. uh, replays, I think it's you know, they 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 are interesting. Yeah. Right. Great to great. talk to you. Thank you so much, really Sean. I really appreciate it. it. Congratulations, yeah. and uh, and we'll speak you. to you again soon. The live poker hand of the week. We have a really interesting one from the Caribbean Poker Party. So let's just jump into it. So we're going to start off this hand actually on the flop, the wrong good and we have Christopher, you. also known as Big Honey, under the gun. We have Aaron in the cutoff. And we have Adrian Mateos in the big blind. Just check it to Aaron. Now, the flop is extremely lethal here. Uh, big Honey with the Ace Queen flopping the top pair with a second nut kicker. Also has some very interesting flush cards here the backdoor Queen of Spades uh, and the Ace of Diamonds blocker if that flush draw comes in. Aaron with the middle set of fives. And Adrian Mateos missing the flop here. Can't continue three ways. So we see a bet from Aaron on the flop. Big Honey doesn't really have a choice here. There's no reason for him to raise with the Ace Queen. It's a very strong hand, but Aaron is either going to be betting really strong hands, but also value betting weaker hands as well, value betting those, and bluffing as well. So just check call, see a turn. Turn is a pretty safe seven of diamonds. You have to think that Big Honey raised under the gun and Aaron called in the cutoff. There's not going to be a lot of, like, 3-4 suited or 4-5 suited or or 6-4, or deuce 4, like, that isn't going to happen in these positions. You could see it in a big blind in some situations, but not here. So, the digits that are at the bottom, they aren't too relevant. You're not going to see any straights on that card. Um, Aaron has an easy bet with the third set at this point. Big Honey, Ace Queen, Love and Life, isn't scared at all at this point. I call. And there we see the call going to the river, which is a very interesting six of diamonds. Now, it does bring in some of the straights, but again, we don't expect our opponents to have those straights very often. The most interesting factor here is the flush. The diamond completes, and you look at Christopher Big Honey's hand. He has the ace of diamonds. Now, Aaron, of course, with the set, still can feel pretty comfortable with his hand. You know, you've got to expect you have the best of it most of the time here. Uh, we don't expect Big Honey to be raising very many straights and get to the river from under the gun here. So really, the only hand you're losing to is a backdoor flush, and you have a set. So you bet. You feel good. Now, action back here on Big Honey. And some of you may be thinking, oh, you kind of got a call here. You have ace-queen. But when we think about it, is Aaron going to be betting a worse hand on the flop into three people, on the turn, and then on the river? 
Is an ace jack gonna do that? And is an ace 10? Nah, it's, that's a little bit too light. So really, Big Honey has a bluff catcher. But he also has the ace of diamonds in his hands, meaning that Aaron can't have the nut flush. So maybe Big Honey could go for a raise here and actually turn his ace queen into a bluff. Being one of the very best players, playing the highest stakes games, highest stakes tournaments out there. There you go, he's done it. We will see in a second. Who does do it? That he picks it up. love this. And he moves all in with the ace queen. Absolutely incredible play pass. here. I, I love it with this ace of diamonds. I mean, it takes a ton of guts as well, like deep in this tournament, to uh, to be able to go for the shove and actually bluff with ace, pair of back. aces and a queen kicker. I mean, incredible play. One that I certainly would miss in real time. I couldn't, couldn't take credit for this. Wow. And a tough spot for Aaron with the set of fives. And he folds. I mean, I can't fault him. It's just one of those spots, like... Do, can, do people bluff here? You know, does the ace queen really bluff here? Give it to Big Honey for uh, getting it done and finding the shove there. Incredible play and uh, proving he's one of the very best out there right now on the circuit. I want to send out a big thanks again to John Duthie for coming on the podcast, taking the time literally the day after a huge score like that, 860,000. Uh, you can tell he's got some experience in the ability to just transition from that craziness into completely normal life you know uh that's something i don't think i would have the ability to do so uh i really appreciate you taking the time john thank you very much for that this is going to be it for the week but one more thing before we go we have the js poker hero competition we're giving away a 215 dollar million ticket so the party poker million every week one million guaranteed 215 dollar buy-in one of you is going to get a ticket all you have to do is use the hashtag JSPokerHero on Twitter. And what I want to see this week is your f best Christmas poker photo. So get festive for me. Christmas is right around the corner. Hashtag JSPokerHero. Send me your best poker Christmas photo. And uh, we're going to pick a winner, and you're going to be our representative in the $215 million. That's going to be it this, for this week. Thank you all so much for checking out the show. Any feedback you have, I'd love to hear it as I continue to try and improve in this, improve in this whole podcasting thing. Um, but that's going to be it. So thanks so much for watching. Until next week, we'll see you later.